Okay, good morning, everybody. We have um, officially reached the apex of complexity for this class. Um, so I will try to go as rapidly as I can without leaving too many people behind. And um, we might spill over into uh, tomorrow's lecture, which is at 10 a.m. tomorrow, not the normal 8 a.m., correct? Yes, great. All right. So. We need to first finish off Monday's lecture, which we had two interesting little consulting problems, which are very much in the spirit of uh, pu the purines that we covered last time. Um, so these are sort of real world problems and um, and we need some thoughts on uh, disconnection. And uh, we'll, where we will start is a sort of normal way, which is to label the rings. And since you've had um, a day or two to think about it, maybe Brendan can tell us uh, a thought on not the route that you would use, but rather just uh, which ring you might want to make and which which ring you might want to annulate onto. So, what my first thoughts would be that maybe making the um, isoxazole might be tricky because if you went through like an oxime, that might be. <clears throat> kind of tricky to control where the oxime condenses onto or the, the hydroxyl amine. So maybe. So your initial B might be tough to tough to do. I mean, that's the one that looks good, but in principle, in practice, it might be tough to execute. This one. So that you ran that through your processor and it came back as being a potentially problematic idea because of the regiochemistry of how the hydroxyl me would add in, correct? Potentially, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. So we're gonna write this one off. Yeah. And then if we do the, the only other choice we have then is kind of um, the three plus three like disconnection. And that leads us back to employing perimeter known logic which gets us back to something like that. And uh, you can imagine that the first step might be to incorporate your amine into that ester. The second step might be uh, thiophosphine. And the third step might be benzyl bromide. So that would give it to you. So now we just need a good way of making that, that isoxazole. And um, if you look at this, you can see that there's probably a couple of things going on here. One of them is what we talked about many, many times. There's a nitrile hiding. Another one is thinking about, well, there's probably also a one, um, one, two, three dicarbonyl that's hiding. And so putting those things together, all we need is a properly protected, um, hydroxylamine. And so the route that one would want to suggest then in such a case would be this, which is a known reaction. So if you treat this with the oxide, you end up getting the condensation, the cyclization. This group here is cleaved after um, cyclization, because that's pretty labile, and you get your key intermediate. Um, so the other possibility would be to think about, instead of bringing this in through thiophosphine, you could imagine, well, but wait a minute, maybe this comes from the corresponding amine. It's also viable if you thought about doing that. And uh, to convert that to the corresponding uh, th uh, thiol linked compound, you could just make the perillium uh, using PEPS chemistry and then displace. Or if you didn't want to do that, you could do Sandmeyer and then displace. And then this just comes back from that compound, which is a Sandmeyer away from the compound we just made. 
all you would need to do to go from here to here is just treat with cyanamide. Hey, Phil. Yeah, what do you say, Carter? Could you potentially start with um, a cyano, a beta cyano substituted beta keto ester and first uh, use a hydroxylamine and potentially get um, condensation first onto the nitrile? Um, unfortunately, if you don't use this protect, so you're saying this exact disconnection, but instead of the protected hydroxylamine, just use hydroxylamine. Essentially, that's the question. Yeah. Unfortunately, that gives the wrong region chemistry, which is why they have to use the protected hydroxylamine. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and you may say, well, can't you just use the same protected hydroxylamine strategy for uh, this one? The problem with that is that uh, that that condensation doesn't work onto that ketone. You need that condensation to work. Whereas this condensation is a really good one because that's a great electrophile. Whereas okay. ketone is not a great electrophile. So that's why Brendan's first instinct and why he said that's not a good idea still holds even with the protected hydroxylamine derivative. Great, okay, thank you. Question. Yep. All right, let's look at another one. This time we've moved over the sulfur atom or the oxygen atom to this position and put a carbon in its place. And we've swapped out that isoxazole now for a isothiazole. Now for the same reasons we have seen in Brendan's uh, original suggestion, uh, we're probably inclined again to think about building up a pyrimidinone from a aminothiazole. So if we draw that disconnection, simplicity, let's just put a placeholder ester here. Now we need to think about making this much more simple looking compound. So is there a key disconnection we can make? We look at this compound and we say, well, we could imagine maybe nitrating the corresponding uh, thiazole, or we could potentially use this trick, which almost always works, which is to identify the nitrile. If we do that, we realize that, oh, we can just take a Feiselman-like approach, or Gwald. When you mix those two together, you get that. And this can be easily reduced to the corresponding H compound by simply uh, treating first with an oxidant like MCPBA, followed by a reducing agent like borohydride. And that will give you the desired amino thiazole. And you may say, hey, Phil, where does this crazy reagent come from? Well, you can buy it. But if I were to guess where the thing came from, I would say it's probably from cyanamide plus CS2 plus methyl iodide, be my guess. <clears throat> hey Phil, could you start with the oxazole and use like Lawson's reagent to exchange that sulfur or no? Um, normally one doesn't use Lawson for these reactions, but rather um, a strong sulfur nucleophile uh, to convert the oxazole into the thiazole. However, with the donating amine here, I would say that's probably a less likely uh, option for you just because that, um, you know, position that you need to re-add into is probably less activated. So the sort of swapping of oxazole to thiazole should be used very sparingly. Just procedurally, it's not a fun reaction to do. All right, great. So let's begin today's lecture, which is, uh, as I promised you, uh, pretty complicated. So we're first going to cover the higher order azoles that have, you know, three nitrogens in them. And then we're going to transition <clears throat> now, then after you know how to make those uh, higher order azole species into the hardest of all of them, which is the bridgehead heterocycles. Uh, these make up uh, a large portion of the you know, problems people encounter in the real world. Uh, let's cover the easiest one first, thanks to 
Wieskin and chemistry here at Scripps, we all are very aware of how to make triazoles using um, so-called click chemistry. We uh, also know from work that was done at Scripps that um, if you have an R3 group on here, that's like a phenyl sulfonyl, that can often serve as a surrogate for an alpha diazoimmune species like you see here. And of course, if you make an alpha diazoimmune, that can cyclize to the one, two, three triazole. But most often, the way I have seen people make triazoles is simply via the uh, click reaction, in which there are me many methods for controlling the regiochemistry. R1 can even be a halide. And using different metals, such as copper and ruthenium, you can get the proper regiochemistry you want. There's one that can't be easily addressed through click chemistry, which is the substitution at this position. And so for that, scientists at BI several years ago reported a very clever way of being able to achieve this uh, transformation by taking the dibromo triazole. And when you treat that with an alkylating agent, you deprotonate, you get selectively the alkylation here. And then you can imagine doing a sequence of uh, two cross couplings to get your other R groups that you want there. <clears throat> okay, let's take a look at one, two, four triazoles, which are far more popular from the standpoint of people having problems. Uh, because click reactions work really well, and there's usually not a lot of problems encountered there. But when you want to make the one, two, four triazole, you really have three options. Um, the first option is simply to take your amidrazone that we learned how to make before from the corresponding nitrile and just condense it with an ester or with an acid and the coupling agent. The next way of doing this is by using an intermediate, uh, such as this diformamide here or this. Uh, DMF, DMA adduct on hydrazine and simply coupling it with an amine to give you this substitution pattern you see here. And finally, the most, one of the most often ways, if not the most often way, is to build it up from these kinds of uh, amino derivatives, where the amino derivative has either a sulfur leaving group or this acylated amidine in which this NH2 serves as a pretty decent leaving group when in the presence of a hydrazine. And this method was pioneered at Genentech. It's a beautiful method that really solves a lot of the problems associated with uh, this, the regiochemically defined synthesis of triazoles. Emblematic of that are the two examples you see here. And when you look at these two examples, you may say, well, you know, how do I control the site of my methyl group here? And the general rule of thumb is that the NH2 of the hydrazine will add into <clears throat> the corresponding amidine part of the molecule. So um, that allows you to program which one is going to be the amidine and which one is going to be the acyl group. And so if we think about this in sort of a, the old fashioned way of um, making it, um, one can imagine this comes from That. And this arises from <clears throat> the corresponding acid plus AR1 amide. And that comes from that. You can also imagine that this were the S methyl. <clears throat> Let's look at another one really quickly before we go through uh, sort of regiochemical summary, which is this one. And this one would derive from, let's just put this as alkyl, and this is the phenyl. This comes from the alkyl. And this is derived from the union of 
your amidine plus <clears throat> so when you add this in this isopropyl hydrazine you'll note that the hydrazinal NH2 is going here and this one is ending up here in the final condensed product that is what we see under these thermodynamic conditions using uh, usually people just heat it up very gently with acetic acid and that is the product you get precisely that regiochemistry really valuable way of making these okay so with this in mind, let's think about our first bridged heterocycle. Uh, we've got a benzodiazepine, which we'll cover a lot more tomorrow. And we've got a triazole fused to it. And we need a way of breaking this up very rapidly. <clears throat> and so if we look at this, we can say, is there something hiding in terms of a functional group that can rapidly uh, allow us to dissect this molecule? So for problem of the day number one, uh, maybe we can call on Sunghan to help us. Uh, I think there's a hidden zone in A ring. Yeah, there's an zone that's hiding, isn't it? Yeah, so you can trace back to a zone and a, a, a acetic acid. And how do we make an amidrazone like that? Uh, I think you can use a hydrazine and react with a, a vinyl chloride. Yeah, and this can generate from the amide. Perfect. <clears throat> hey, Phil, you, yeah. Instead of um, doing the hydrazine, could you turn the lactam into um, like add an oxime and tosylate the alcohol and cook it up with acetonitrile? So that is the product of hydroxylamine addition. Now, what do you want to do? Tosylate the um, oxime alcohol and then cook it up with the nitrile. With the hope being that you would get an attack here, lose that, and then it would cyclize. Yeah. I've only seen uh, this type of thing work intramolecularly. I've never seen a disconnection like that intermolecularly. Um, I would say we could search and see if such a thing exists, but in general, I wouldn't use Ritter like reactivity on nitrogen in an intermolecular setting. But I'm going to come back to you later in this lecture, Tim, since you seem to be the expert on oxime activation and uh, ask you again for your help when we get to compounds where that transformation would be particularly valuable because it will come up again. But in this particular case, I would advocate for Occam's razor and uh, just go with the amidrazone because then you don't have to worry about the fidelity of the NN bond formation from an oxy in an intermolecular setting. Okay, great. Let's look at tetrazoles. Two main ways I've ever seen tetrazoles made. One is kind of like the von Richter cinnolin synthesis, where you generate this via diazidization and then closure from the corresponding uh, amidrazone. The other main way of making these is through the use of a dipolar cycloaddition uh, with an azide and a nitrile. 
But I will tell you that in that case, the preponderance of the literature in that area is just using sodium azide. Substituted azides are hit and miss. So while I show this is a possible disconnection, you need to tread carefully with it in the real world. So let's take a look at this bridged heterocycle. We've got a nitrogen in the ring. We've got a tetrazole linked to it. Um, so how in the world are we going to put this thing together for the treatment of asthma? Well, we just looked above at a really good way to make this, as I mentioned, using something like sodium azide. And so probably we can just excise azide from that straight away. Now we need a good way of making that. Our first bridged heterocycle uh, that I'm gonna, well, first of this type, this is a very popular type that you see. Um, so maybe Nathan can help us out on what might be a good disconnection of this. And if Nathan's not around, uh, perhaps we can get Tawei to chime in. How about Ellie? Well, since we're all alone today, um, I'm going to see if I can see someone on the screen. How about Carter? Um, so I was thinking of breaking um, B. That sounds great. Now, if we break B, that's all you needed to say, Carter, because we really don't have any choices. Once you break B, the only thing we can do is this. That's really all we got. You could also, you know, and then you, this corresponding product, you lose ammonia um, during the reaction, but you could also propose in the synthesis, if you didn't know that, you could also just propose that and then convert the remaining ester to the nitrile. That's cool too. But that's really the only option we have. What about breaking, you know, this here? Is this a disconnection that anybody wants to do? How about that deals alder? Yeah, doesn't look so good. So <clears throat> great. It's the only disconnection that makes sense, but you could draw out the other disconnection I drew out and immediately realize, nope, that's not very logical. And then this one, you're like, wow, I know how to make aminopyridines. I've been making those for a long time now. And this is just a three plus three disconnection to make a primitive. So that's easy. That is, you can ignore the rest of the purity ring and just imagine you've got that, right? A regular pyrimidone, pyrimidone synthesis would involve an amidine and your beta keto ester. And here, that's your amidine. Two amino pyridines are amidines, essentially. Okay, great. Let's move on to oxidiazoles. So, you know, they come in many flavors. Uh, the main ones you'll see are the first three, the one, two, four, really just the one, two, four, and the one, three, four, are the ones I see the most often. The one, two, five, and the furox, fur, furoxan are very rarely employed. Um, usually a furoxan is an intermediate en route to a one, two, five oxidiazole. But often these one, two, five oxidiazoles have, I, as I have seen over the years, some metabolic liabilities. So med chemists make them, but they don't progress very far because then they run their metstab assay and they find, oh, it's not so stable. So how do you make these uh, one, two, four the, amongst the most popular uh, oxidiazoles? You can either make them by a three plus two reaction, which can be somewhat um, difficult based on the electronics you see. So I don't see that used very often. The most often pathway is via the uh, not the amidrazone, but rather the amidoxime. And the amidoxime is, of course, available from the corresponding nitrile. That's how you get all of these, as I think we talked about many times now. You take the amidoxime, 
you condense that with an acid or an acid chloride or even an ester can work and you'll get out your 1,2,4 oxidiazole. The 1,3,4 oxidiazoles are often made via the Robinson-Gabriel cyclodehydration of these diacylated hydrazines. And finally, the 1,2,5 oxidiazoles tend to like to use in the case where these two are um, not benzanulated, but rather two different substituents, they tend to like to use Timmis's connection, wherein you dehydrate on one of the nitrogens to form that NO bond. Usually you can treat with something like a little bit of dilute acid or a dehydrating agent like tosyl chloride works fine as well. All right, so with all of those things in mind, let's take a look at this PDE4 inhibitor from Merck. And so this is a great problem because it incorporates a lot of the different concepts we have dating back all the way to lecture number one. So um, the first thing we probably want to do in this molecule is let's just get rid of this fragment up here. Let's make things a little more uh, simplified. Let's remove it in the form of the boronic acid. We're in MedChem. And let's go back to the corresponding bromide. Now, the next disconnection we want to make goes back to lecture number one. So what would be a logical disconnection to make here? Um, let's see if anyone else is on the line. Uh, how about uh, Simona? Can you just do a cannabinagle condensation? Aha, uh -huh. why did you say cannabinagle? I mean, um, you know, that, that may be confusing to people because could I just take Yet you are telling us today, what magic are you advocating for here, Simona? That I can. Well, I'd assume, I'd assume that that position is probably pretty acidic because um, you have that imine-like position. And that sulfonyl group there is helping out too. Yeah, the electron withdrawing aryl group. Yeah. Fantastic. So this is really acidic. I don't think it's as good as a malinate but it's pretty darn acidic. So yeah, brilliant. It's exactly what you can do. Of course, this top example is hearsay. Can never do that. But this one works just fine. All right, so then how do we make this compound? Can we use what we learned uh, above? What do you yeah, say? Yeah, can you, can you use the amidoxine? Brilliant. which is commercially available, or if you're stuck on a desert island with coconuts, find yourself some acetonitrile and add in hydroxylamine. Great. Let's take a look at um, an example of a rare type of heterocycle, but they do sometimes exist. Um, and the means with which we can put this together. Um, so any thoughts here? Well, the first disconnection we can probably make very quickly to simplify our life is just to disconnect there, right? So we know we can do an SNIR, no problem, minus pyridine chloride. And let's just focus on the key problem of how do we make this strange looking heterocycle. You can use the double oxime in this case. Aha. The double oxy, so that would mean you essentially are going to be looking for you want to make something like this, Nor. Is that right? Yeah. Let's put that in quotes. Now, because it's aromatic, these hydroxylamines are going to be pretty unstable, and so we need an equivalent to this. As you can imagine, this type of compound, if we want a conceptual equivalent to it, might be best put together via something like this. If we nitrosylate this compound, as we learned with the Beirut uh, synthesis, 
this compound is essentially going to immediately turn into this creature. Which we can then reduce with anything, PCL3, usually what people use to reduce off that NL bond and then do the SNAR or do the SNAR first and then reduce off that NL bond. But you got it. Exactly right, Noor. That's what you want to be thinking about. You want to, you want to look at that and you say, well, I know that's not stable, so I need a conceptual equivalent to it. I know I can probably get this compound. It's either commercial or I can probably get it from the corresponding nitrochloro compound, right? Brilliant. All right. I was scared. I didn't know if you were with us today, Noor. That's great. Um, yes, sir. I thought we didn't have lecture today. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, good. Well, I'm glad you're on. So thiodi thiodiazoles, another really fun class. And I don't know if you noticed, but sort of all of these uh, triazole, oxidiazole type species are beginning to use a lot of the same logic that we have learned over and over again. So while I promised you high complexity, it shouldn't be shocking. And it shouldn't be introducing reactivity principles that are just alien to you. And that's why we go through these rather rapidly because they really build on the things you've already learned before. In the case of the thiodiazoles, we're obviously gonna be taking advantage of what we learned from the worlds of thiazole chemistry and most notably isothiazole chemistry that we spent quite a bit of time on several lectures ago. So for the one, two, three thiodiazole class, one can imagine treating that with SSCL2, we'll introduce our sulfur atom which will then get cyclized and lose this carbonate. So you can go from a hydrazone to a 1,2,3 uh, thiodiazole. The 1,2,4 thiodiazole is really taking out of the playbook of isothiazole chemistry. You can either use this reagent, which will give you R2 equal to chloro, or you can take an amidine, for example, treat it with KSCN and sodium hypochlorite, and that will give you directly the amino uh, thiodiazole. For the one, two, three, four thiodiazole, you can imagine that that will arise from uh, the corresponding thiosemicarboside, as shown here, using um, trim, tri you know, an alkyl orthoformate. So you're disconnecting across those bonds. Or we can do what Tim wanted to do before that works really well in the cases of a uh, uh, oxidiazole, unlike an oxazole, an oxidiazole can actually be exchanged uh, more readily due to the fact that it is far more electron deficient. So you can take your oxidiazole and convert it into the thiodiazole. And we'll learn how to make, uh, well, we just learned how to make these oxidiazoles. So you know that already, that this is coming back from the dehydration of a diacylated hydrazine. hydrazine. And then finally, the 1,2,5 thiodiazole is a rarely encountered species I have very rarely ever seen these used, uh, presumably because of some metabolism problem as well. They may not be the most stable heterocycle, but nevertheless, from a diamine, these can be made using dichloro uh, sulfide. All right, <clears throat> let's take a look at some real world examples. Uh, the first one we'll cover is this modulator of adenosine A1 receptor. So um, in order to think about disconnecting this one, we really need to think about the isothiazole lecture. So I'll label these in order to help uh, participation. And if we hearken back to the old days of isothiazole chemistry, what bond was strategic to make in those cases? Does anybody remember? Break the uh, NS bond. Perfect, thanks Alex. So we disconnect at one, two, and that really will give us something that looks like this. So if we just treat this with an oxidant, whatever you want, air might do it. In this case, they use H2O2, whatever. Now, how do we make this thing? Well, you can imagine that right here is a NCS fragment. So if we draw this out, Uh, and 
second. Missed a carbon there. If we make a species like that and add in aniline to it, we should get that. And the question is, how do you make that? Well, you had learned several times already that um, when we add in something like KNCS, there's an addition that takes place at sulfur, not nitrogen. But I'm going to confuse you by telling you now that when you take a compound like this and you treat it with K and CS, the product you get is not attack, uh, attack at sulfur, but rather attack at nitrogen. And the reason for that is this is the thermodynamic and this is the kinetic. So what happens is initial addition at um, sulfur, and then you can imagine this intermediate can equilibrate through a nitrillium ion. And then rearrangement takes place to give you the isothiocyanate you see here, connected at nitrogen, not at sulfur. This rearrangement can't take place in the case where we talked about before. Remember, we would have compounds like that, and we could show how they would go to SCN, for example. Do you guys remember that? That's not something that can, can be reverse, reversible. So in this case, it is reversible, and that's why you can get uh, this product. So this works with acid chlorides. It also works with iminoyl chlorides, and it can be inhibited through the addition of acid. But when you heat them up, you get this compound, you add an aniline and then H2O2 and you get out your product. If that's confusing, let me know. Otherwise, I'll assume I've done a competent job of explaining why you get that reverse regiochemistry. Hey, Phil. Yes. Question, could you take the aniline and do an attack on your phenyl nitrile and then trap with um, an acyl amide and then uh, convert that to the sulfur instead? Treat that with Lawson's reagent and um, uh, and cyclias, I think that's probably a viable disconnection. And then this comes from this amidine. Is that right, Tim? The, yeah. the only, and yeah, I think that would probably be fine. And the amidine can be accessed again via, let's just call that intermediate A, by intermediate A. Or perhaps you might get lucky and you could treat intermediate A directly with that urea and it would give you that. Certainly something if you put on a test or in a job interview, nobody would be yelling at you. Everybody would say yes, reasonable. Great. Hey, Tom. Um, if you used KSCN, would that attack at sulfur? Well, as I said, if you add KSCN, it's going to add at sulfur and then rearrange the nitrogen. Because it would it, still re rearrange. You could not get the kinetic. Uh, which intermediate are we adding to, Nick? Uh, if you well, if you were to say again, use the same intermediate A, and then and then you wanted to get the opposite. If you wanted to get the opposite compound. If you wanted to add at sulfur as a kinetic product. Then what you would do is add acid. So as I mentioned, if you want to inhibit, if you want to inhibit that rearrangement, what people have found is the addition of acid will do that. Good question. Okay, thanks. Yep, great. All right, let's go on to uh, even more difficult stuff. Um, so bridgehead heterocycles. Uh, I'm not gonna obsess over how they're named. My recommendation would be in the naming area would be to use ChemDraw to do the name for you. The names are shown here. Normally, the A designation refers to the bond. So this would be the A bond of the pyridine. And then the one, two refers to the five-membered ring labeling. But the naming is confusing. I don't remember much of it. I don't ever use it. Nobody in the real world uses it. The only time you'll need it is for a patent. And um, then what you would do is you would copy and paste the name into ChemDraw and have it translated for you. 
uh, because these are really complicated and often you'll find even in the patent literature they get it wrong. So the old school ways of naming things are flawed with the fact that not everybody is perfect on those rules and therefore structures are the best way to make sure that you're actually looking at the procedure of the right compound. So they're named here just for completion sake, but it's not something you need to memorize for this class, nor do I recommend you memorize it for any purpose at all. So there's a lot better use of your random access memory in your head than memorizing IUPAC name, nomenclature. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, imidazo uh, pyridine shown here. And um, can we just use old school imidazole chemistry to think how it might be made? Well, yeah, let's just look at it as an imidazole. If it was just an imidazole, if it was just, you know, if I could just block out somehow, just block this out, would you have a problem making that? No, of course not. So let's just block that out and think about what you would need. Well, clearly you would probably just need an amino purity, which is an amidine, as we talked about before, hiding. And uh, you could react that perhaps with where the bromide gets alkylated here and the amino group condenses here. That's the trend you always see in this type of chemistry. How about the imidazopyridine isomers 1,5 shown to the right? Well, the same story again. Um, does it make sense if we look at this? I mean, we didn't do it with the other heterocycle, but does it make sense to you ever to do something like this? At this point in the class, you probably should feel very uncomfortable about trying to annulate on an imidazole a benzene ring. I hope at least. We'll see an example where this can sometimes make sense, but um, you know, the easiest Occam's razor disconnection here is simply to say, well, this is just a condensation. Look, I got an acid that's hiding here. So can I just take this, this aminomethylpyridine and simply react it? Uh, with the corresponding acid? Of course you can, easy. Where do we get this compound? Well, we learned a hundred ways of making this. You, you can imagine this comes from the cyanopyridine, of which there's dozens of ways to make. You can imagine it comes from the corresponding methyl group through an oxidation, reductive amination, you could do bulkalhyde, so at this point, you should be very well, you know, you should be very comfortable with uh, having to make an amino methyl purity. Great. Well, let's take a look at- um, I, yeah. I, uh, I just have a quick question. Yeah, what do you say? Uh, do you think we can condense the uh, R1 nitride with the uh, aldehyde purity? Um, well, that, I have never seen that disconnection before. Um, it might be a known one. I certainly haven't committed to memory all of the ways of making these, but it's not a disconnection I've seen before, presumably because, again, I would probably, the same trap that Tim fell into before, I would avoid using nitriles as nucleophiles that, uh, that are not on either an intramolecular setting or in a straight Ritter type of pathway where you're intercepting a carbocation. So I would avoid that near end. It's a disconnection which you probably, you might be able to find a site finder hit for it, but I've really not seen it used very much. Okay, thank you. That's not to say it's impossible. I'm sure you can site find it on your own if I, oh, Phil's wrong. Okay, I just haven't seen it very used very much if it, if it does exist at all. Great. Okay. So let's um, take a look at the pyrazolo pyridine. And uh, these are a little trickier because it's a type of uh, bond that we really haven't seen before. And um, so now we have to talk about making the NN bond because we know that disconnecting right across here is probably not going to be so strategic. So the fastest way to make this would be to think about how do we turn a pyridine into a hydrazenal pyridine? 
we need a hydrazine, don't we? So you can actually take pyridine. You can aminate it. Uh, there are ways of doing this uh, dating back to the old days where they use chloramine, which is not that safe, but now there are more safe ways of doing it um, with derivatives like this that have different R groups on here. There's also these types of derivatives which have been used. Uh, admittedly, process chemists don't like to do this, but there are OPRD papers where they do it and there are reagents for amino transfer that are safe. And in some cases, you simply cannot avoid it. Such as a simple case here, it would be very difficult to imagine a way of making this compound practically that doesn't involve something like that. Now, if R2 is an electron withdrawing group, you can actually add in, let's say an ester here, an alkyne like that directly to get out your product wherein this nitrogen first has its conjugate addition and then addition then into the C2 position. And then if R2 is equal to H, there's other ways of doing this. So let's return now back to Tim. If we used your disconnection before Tim, we are good to go. So that would require that we use um, a disconnection right across here. And now, Maybe we found a way and a process setting to avoid the N amination. Now, if you treat that with acid or a little tazo chloride, you can do what Tim wanted to do before. And there's many ways of making this, obviously, from the corresponding ketone. One can also even imagine uh, doing something very similar to what we saw above. Some modification of that is sometimes you'll see in the literature people using these strange heterocycles. Not often applied, but if you look in the literature, you will find this type of reaction. But by far, the most popular ones are the first two I show at the top. Okay, so let's talk about what happens when we start putting three nitrogens in the top ring. Now we have to take advantage of the triazole chemistry we just learned a few minutes ago and apply it to the problem of the bridge series. So how are we going to address that? Well, um, let's take a look at this compound here and imagine you know, what bond might be logical to break there. Can anyone see a bond that is logical and hiding within this structure? Maybe um, Sung Han, who gave us the right answer for a problem, which is quite related to this one. Uh, I'm thinking about use a hydrazine. Yeah, look at this, folks. In this structure is hiding an amidrazone, isn't it? It's a hiding amidrazone. And that can be recapitulated. How do you like that? That looks like a reaction that's going to work well, doesn't it? Sure is. Easy. <clears throat> How about this compound? Um, let's go to, uh, I guess we can go to this one next. Um, what might be a strategy for putting this together? Well, we can look at this and we can say, hmm, um, if we go back to the triazole synthesis paper, uh, section of the notes, doesn't look like we can really do a click reaction on this one. That doesn't look very logical. But if we look at the other possible way of making triazoles via diazo ketones, we see
that there's actually a diazo compound hiding here. So this, if you make this species, it will immediately turn itself into the triazolo compound, just I summarized to that. And often the way this manifests itself is you'll see people take this compound, they treat it with something like um, trizzle azide and do a diazo transfer reaction, which gives them that, which then instantaneously cyclizes to the product. But you could derive this yourself very quickly, just using the logic we just talked about. How about this one? Can break the NN bond. So we can imagine that, thank you, Alex. We can imagine that if we made a compound like that, we could just couple that with uh, the corresponding acid, correct? Sure. Oh, I didn't have that in mind. I mean. Well, you said break the NN bond. Uh, oh, oh, I see. Oh, you meant uh, a Tim-like disconnection. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this one is minus water. And this one is oxidation. This one scares me a little bit, depends on the context, right? I, I'm, I'm a little worried about the energetics of a compound like that. I just don't know. And it might be a really, really polar compound, but it's a disconnection you should keep in mind because in certain cases it, it is used. Can you selectively <clears throat> install the amino group on the nitrogen without like touching the amino substituent? That is sometimes the issue, but what they see, and I've seen this multiple times in general, the pyridine nitrogen is the one that gets aminated. You do not get, with those nitrogen transfer reagents, you get the main product being on pyridine, not on the amine, of a two amino pyridine. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, this is too simple for you folks. So we should probably move on to something even more complicated. How about now where we've got two nitrogens in the six-membered ring? Now, now, what do we do here? Um, so for this particular reaction, you can imagine that uh, the way to forge uh, this bond would just be to react the two amino pyrimidine with T-butyl isonitrile and benzaldehyde. That three component coupling works well to get a compound like that. Other ways of making this? Well, um, you might imagine that this, you, if you looked at it from the standpoint of being in a midazole, you might begin thinking about other coupling partners that one could use to give equivalent products. For example, you could maybe think about And of course, with that, you'd have to worry about regiochemistry. Um, but it could be something you could think about. You could also maybe think about having an ester here, um, adding in the amino group, and then um, having some sort of oxidative cyclization, and then a courteous rearrangement, perhaps. But the fastest way to enter this is just using the isonitrile uh, and then condensing intramolecularly with the benzaldehyde imine that's generated in one pot. Uh, let's take a look at this one. Uh, in order to access this compound, all you need to do is dump and stir with the propylate. Easy. And finally, let's take a look at an example which is rather striking because it kind of challenges you to think about something we haven't thought about before in the form of problem of the day number two. And we need someone to volunteer to help us with what bond might be a good one to break. 
which ring do you want to make first and then second? I think you um, can uh, start with B and then make A. Start with B and then make A, which would lead us down a road like this. Kelly, is that what you're thinking? Yep. Great. What if we had to make uh, B from A? Then you would need um, you can the imidazole with maybe like an aldehyde appended to it. So Kelly has deftly recognized that that carbon there could be a hiding aldehyde. And now what she needs to do to pull this off is somehow find a derivative that would give us access to that. We need access to that. Is there any reagent we have learned in this class that would give us access to something equivalent to that? The Tosmic. Oh boy, you're on a roll today. So if you treat that with Tosmic, you get out this nice product. And then all you need to do is burn this off. <clears throat> so sometimes making the six member ring can be useful. Brilliant. All right, let's look at some other really, um, yeah, question from the outside? Yeah, before we get too far from this, uh, someone wants to know how to do the one to three inch out of the 30 single figures of metal. Specifically, is the dye zone able to go deep with everyone heating and can you cross from both ends? Uh, it depends. If the one, two, three triazole has got an electron withdrawing group, you can often see decomposition because of the reversible opening to the diazonium. However, if it's alkyl or aryl, you generally see them to be stable. Good question. All right. Um, quinazoleums, you know, they're kind of rare, uh, but seen enough that it makes sense for us to briefly cover them. Um, so let's take a look at an example where you would actually see one. Um, this may be rather easy for you. Um, any thoughts on a disconnection that might work here? Can, is there one that we might be able to just cut right across somewhere? Yeah, so you can break one, two, and then four or five. Awesome. Perfect. Product. That's it. We know this is super acidic. This is this one's like a malinate. It's going to add right in, condense, and we are done. Uh, 3H pyrrolazines. Sometimes you see these proposed. They are rarely going to be stable things that you actually are going to see used in, in MedChem, but um, you know, sometimes you encounter them. Normally you encounter them in the context of something like this, where there is a, you know, uh, a thiazole or some electron deficient heterocycle attached to it. So thoughts on how we might be able to put this one together. Can you disconnect to the hydrozone? So cleave the NN bond. Something like this? Yeah. That looks pretty good to me. Fantastic. And then this just comes back from the aldehyde and hydrazine. Perfect. Yep. Brilliant. All right. So uh, we're doing, I think we're doing okay on time. I, I think we're doing good on time, which I'm rather shocked about um, because I thought we would go way over. So let's uh, bask in the celebration of being on time with uh, a nice exploration of problem of the day number three and four, uh, which are newly added uh, features to the lecture. 
Uh, these are real world problems. Uh, one of them is quite pretty famous, the uh, problem today number four. Uh, but problem today number three is a, is a real doozy. Um, so we need to think about um, disconnections at this point that make sense from a med chem standpoint where we want modularity in the ability to probe saturated heterocycles here that we'll learn about on Friday, an intermediate scaffold here, and then a sort of uh, extraneous arrow group here. So we want to be able to put those together in a nice modular format. How can we do that? Any volunteers? Can you do SNAR with the less leftmost component and then uh, Suzuki to connect the middle one and the rightmost? So let's put a chloro here. This sounds fantastic. Let's put a fluoro here so we can do SNAR on that side. We're going to need to. Um, we have our amine, get rid of that. And we have the other fragment. Boy, this is a great problem. Look at all these bridge heterocycles. So we're gonna put those two together. Awesome, great, Simona. Now, now the problem is we just have to make these things. <laughs> right? So. You know, um, how are we going to do that? Any 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 suggestions there? Either one of them. Let's we can. Yeah. Thing. Um, the one on the left first. I guess there's a uh, amir amine pyridine. Uh -huh. And so Simona has recognized a hiding amino pyridine. Brilliant, because it's just an amidine after all. And what's the other fragment? If you took away amino pyridine, all I have left is that. Some kind of malinate. Yeah, perfect. Done. Perfect. All right, we got that fragment. Now we need to make this fragment. Phil, could you explain guess... why you get chlorination? only at one of the two? Sure. The intermediate you get from that condensation is going to be this. And um, it prefers to exist in this tautomer versus this less stable tautomer. So the PLCL3 will give you uh, chlorination of that intermediate rather than this intermediate, which is just not as happy of a tautomeric form. Great, great question. Um, continuing onwards then, we've got to make this uh, pyridazine linked to an imidazole. And uh, gee, you know, what about, I don't know, maybe this would work. Does that look okay? Uh, Simona, what do you think? Do you like that? Uh, I feel like you would have regiochemical problems. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm feeling regiochemical problems. I, I don't know how to easily, you know, install that nitrogen there with the right regiochemistry and then the subsequent cyclization. I don't know if I'm going to get the right regiochemistry there. If it's going to cyclize in a carbon like that, that seems just wacky. I might go here. It doesn't feel right on many levels. So I really don't have much of a choice then, but to go back to uh, the opposite disconnection. So if I look at it from the opposite standpoint, I think, okay, there's a pyrimidine, um, sorry, no, uh, pyridazine, and it must be an amino pyridazine in order for me to make my imidazole really easily. So this B pin can probably be installed through a meoroborylation. That leads us back down the road towards
Does that one feel good to you? Yeah, that looks better. Okay. And this one simply comes back from, and then your next question is, hey, Phil, how do they control the regiochemistry? And the answer is they're in MedChem, they don't. So they get the mixture of the two. Uh, only one of them, um, after, after cyclization to the mixture, they then separate to get their desired uh, product. So uh, rather than coming up with a regioselective synthesis of the pyridazine shown here, it's faster just to take the mixture, carry it forward, separate, because this is cheap as chips. This is free. Mix them together, get the separated product from your analytical team. This is Genentech, so they probably have a multi-million dollar separation center and then just do your Mior borrelation and you're good to go. So set, coming up with a regioselective synthesis of a compound like this, if they're, if they're separable by an analytical department is a complete waste of time. If you're a med chemist and the only question you have to ask and answer is, is it a good compound? What's the bioactivity? Speed is the most key. So for a process approach, would that, would, would you have to build the ring? Well, if this was a process, I don't know if this compound made it uh, to process chemistry, but if it were a process approach, we'd have to probably rethink the problem. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps uh, a compound like this. Oh, let's think about it. I mean, I never thought about it before, Nick, but yeah, let's pretend you're at Genentech and you're asking me this question. Um, you know, maybe one way to do it would be via courteous. And then um, this compound can come from that. And then this compound can come back from. that through a diazo transfer chemistry. So that can be done on scale. That's how BMS makes its TIC2 inhibitor. So you would then incorporate the, the, the you would do a diazotization there, it would cyclize, and then you would do a courteous. I don't know, there may be a better way to do it, but um, if you put me on the spot, that may be one thing to think about. And that's, yeah, that's definitely a very, very reasonable approach. So with the diazo compounds, they also use, use them on scale, right? You can, in a, in a case like these pyridazines, I've seen them used and- um, Because for example, for Curtis, you would need an azide. Uh, that is, you, you don't, now there's other ways of doing the hydrazine, uh, the, the diazotization, I believe, but um, even if you needed an azide, you probably could do it in a case like this. I've seen it done. Okay, so, okay yeah, great. You know, if it's a safe azide. Um, but they have ones on process scale that you can use for this. So, yeah, that's okay, a good question. Yeah, yeah I mean, further, further thought of this might be, you know, another person might say, well, maybe there's a way to do a reach of selective um, uh, SNAR on these two compounds that could be worth looking into as well. Um, you could also imagine maybe this compound comes back from the corresponding compound here where you do selective deoxy functionalization. That might also be something that the process chemist would, would look at during the ideation stage. Later this morning in the guest lecture, I think we'll hear about uh, that kind of way of achieving process synthesis, where you go through an ideation stage where you draw out many possibilities. And that would be the process you would go through. All right, great. So in the interest of time, let's keep going to remdesivir, which is of course a really famous compound uh, these days because of its antiviral activity. And I'm going to remove all the spinach and just get us back to uh, this simple compound. And then we can begin. So hopefully someone is ready to volunteer. To help us figure out how to make this very relevant bridged heterocycle. All right, who's gonna help us? Any first disconnection we can do to 
make things a little simple. Remove the header cycle. Yeah, let's get rid of the header. Let's break this bond ASAP. So this uh, ribonolactone can be uh, added into, and then you can use uh, oxonium and cyanide to put your nitrile in. And now all we need is this pivotal heterocycle. All right, so how do we make this? Is there a first disconnection we can do? Well, you can use the ChemDraw predictor and find out that we can get rid of that iodine and put there, if you do an iodination, it's gonna go there. So let's just put H here. Now it's even simpler. All right, this is a problem of the day. So we're supposed to have someone help us. So I've gotten you all the way back to the hydrogen compound. Now there should be someone who is in desperate need of pyridoge who would like to volunteer? Can you start with the um, two cyano parole? The two cyano parole. And then do what, Nora? Well, somehow you can make the amidine to the nit to, from the nitro group. From the nitrile, you want to make the amidine. Now what? Can you somehow oxidize like the pearl nitrogen? <laughs> uh -huh, you can. Yes, you can. Yes. So don't do this yet. You're absolutely right. Simply take this and make the NN bond. A little bit of base and a nitrogen transfer reagent of the type we covered above will give you that. And then you take this, form amidine acetate, and you get out your product. That was good. Yeah, pretty good. So that's one way to do it. Um, you know, one can also imagine that uh, since we have to keep the costs really, really low, that um, instead of getting the, uh, this compound from cyanopyrrole, you can imagine it just comes from pyrrole. You can do a Vilsmeyer hack formulation, treat that aldehyde with hydroxylamine, dehydrate, and that will, give you the, uh, that will give you the nitrile, which can then be immediately aminated to give you this intermediate product. Now, what if you said, uh, you know, hey, Phil, we really don't want to use those N-aminating reagents. Is there a way we can make something like this without the N-aminating agent? Nor how would you do it? They put you on the spot, send you to the board and say, you're not allowed to break that bond. I just make, um, well, I would start with the, make the ring itself Brilliant. with the hydrazine instead of ammonia. Awesome. Brilliant. Okay, well, that's great. That gives us a, a hearty 15 minutes to cover the real world consulting problems of which there are uh, a few really good ones. Oh, and we have all that stuff. Oh, geez, I am really behind. Well, I thought I was good, but it turns out I'm not. So let's go through these as um, rapidly as we can without losing anyone. So if you look at this compound, you say, all right, well, we need to put that in place. And we, uh, to me, the first thing I think about is getting this oxidation state to something which is gonna allow for the opening of new disconnections. And in order to open up some new disconnections, I'm gonna convert that thing into a ketone. And then I'm gonna look at this and say, well, um, oh, did I put it in the wrong spot? Sorry about that. And then I look at this compound and I say, well, 
I can break this bond in a couple of different ways. I can either break it here, or I can break it here. So the green disconnection would be using that type of reactivity, because that is kind of like a ketone, as we learned in lecture one, or I can use the red reactivity and simply do um, palladium catalyzed ketone aerylation. So this one requires that adding in, and this one requires that one adding in there. All right, so now I've got some two viable intermediates and now I need to think about how to make this. And so um, I can look at this and say, well, I would like to avoid any kind of N amination chemistry if possible, um, but it's probably gonna be hard to, to do that. But I anyway can think about how I might be able to do that. And it leads me back to anyway, this disconnection. And all we need to do to make that is using Ullman. And then decarboxylation gets us to here. We can do the anamination snapshot POBR3. Um, will give us our uh, corresponding bromide. Same exact logic for this one. We can use Tim's logic, though. On the hydroxy on the oxine to forge that bond. Great. So super, super simple. Once we unveiled the ketone that was hiding here, if I kept it at the alcohol, this may be a little bit more difficult. I guess we could still take this compound, deprotonate it, and add it to, into benzaldehyde. So I guess it's still not the end of the world. Okay, let's take a look at this next one. Um, this next one's got this alpha hydroxy acid. And so the first thing I'm going to think about doing is let's get rid of that. And so first thing I want to do in disconnecting this is giving myself a stable form of that alpha hydroxy ketone. Which you can imagine, as we talked about before, might be a furan which can be unveiled just a little MCQBA. And then this compound can potentially come back to the same logic we've seen before. This is a hiding imidazole, and we know that can be made through an aminopyridine. So let's draw the aminopyridine. And now we need a way of making that. And um, this one could be made in a few different ways. But you can imagine that uh, the faster we can get to a famous name reaction that maybe someone could spit out, the better. Sorechki's door. Yes, brilliant. Awesome. And uh, here is just your purine or lithium. Now we learned in a past consulting problem of ways to uh, get to uh, the alpha keto esters that um, use Bode Wasserman techniques. So you could make this as well from the corresponding carboxylic acid here. We learned that already. So the furane trick is just a alternative to that. All right, let's move on to this next one. And we look at this next one, we think to ourselves, well, uh, we're probably going to be able to put this arrow group in later. And we're probably going to want to look at this as like an aminopyridine. And this bromo is probably incorporatable after that amine is in. So let's dramatically simplify it straight away. We've got our chloro there. We've got our ester here. We would do SNAR, and then we would do NBS. 
all right, now all we need to do is make this. And, you know, this one is uh, pretty much child's play. Easy. That, that came apart pretty quickly. And the final one, how are we gonna put this together? Well, we've got two ring systems. We've got those annoying halogen atoms that med, med chemists just absolutely adore. And um, so we've got to figure out a way of uh, putting this together. And it probably would be an ideal building block if you could simply take this compound That would be a great building block. And in fact, that is known. So if you take the amino pyrazine and you simply treat it with uh, BR2 or NBS, you can get dibromination to give you that product and it stops at the dibroma. That's fortuitous. Now all we need to do is treat this with DMF, DMA. And subsequently, bromoacetonitrile. And what you're going to get as an intermediate there is, of course, and when you treat that with base, it's going to cyclize. Why does the uh, alkylation take place at this nitrogen and not the other nitrogen? Well, you guys are pros. We learned this a long, long time ago. Those were ancient days. It's all guided by sterics. So uh, this nitrogen, of course, has got those two ortho substituents. It's going to be very difficult to alkylate it, and that's why you get that reach of selectivity. Fantastic. Well, we're still doing good um, on time. Yes. How about the nitrogen on the amidine moiety? Um, Will it be alkylated? No, no. This one is not very basic. This is no, not the right. idea that what because like basically it's also an aluminium time like that. Yes, that, that's the mean is like more electron rich because like it has a uh, conjugation from the uh, dimethyl amino. No, no, it's kind of like DMF. Yeah, so no, it okay. doesn't. This is this is your this is your nucleophilic one. DMF DMA is a great protecting group for amino heterocycles, by the way. These, these groups here are invisible. They're used all the time in oligonucleotide chemistry and um, amino thi aminothiazoles, amino imidazoles. They're fantastic protecting groups for amino pyridines, okay? And because they're not really reactive. Okay, thank you. Yep, great. All right, let's see how fast we can build this one. Uh, this one looks to me, unless we made a mistake, like this fragment is the same as this fragment, isn't it? So probably anything we come up with here, we better have a way of making this in a symmetrical fashion. So I'm gonna bet if we just took pyrazine and formaldehyde, that's probably gonna do a nice manic reaction for us. That simplifies things quite a bit. So, this adds into the corresponding manic adduct, not once, but twice. Great. Now all we have to do is make that. So how are we going to make that? Well, um, we can think of it as either a uh, amidazolone that's adding into something, but then we have a regiochemical quagmire of this nitrogen versus that nitrogen, or we can think of it as just a uh, amino oxazole that is appending onto it an imidazole. And the latter is the way to go. So that gives you your bridged heterocycle. And where does this thing come from? Well, it doesn't get much easier than this. Hydroxycyclohexanone plus your friend cyanamide. Because as we know, that carbon there is your hiding nitrile. Great. 
Let's move on to this vexing looking compound in uh, what might be the most complicated heterocycle we cover. Uh, this one, gee, don't know where to start on this one. Um, I guess I'm gonna try to simplify it a little bit. M maybe the first thing I'm gonna think about doing is let's see if we can get at least, you know, have mercy on me a little bit. Let's get rid of that. And let's see if that makes things a little bit simpler for us. This is an OPRD paper. So that means there's not gonna be any cross coupling around here. And once we do that, we end up with, let's say, an OH here, which we can then convert into a chloro. That part is good. And then we've got this methyl here, we've got this nitrogen here. So geez, a lot of nitrogen is going on in this compound. So now how do we disconnect it? Let's think about it strategically. Let's draw a ring A, ring B. Imagine if they throw a beast like this on the board to you when you're interviewing, what are you going to do? Well, I guess one thing you can look at is uh, think about which ring, you go back to basics, which ring is less aromatic, right? And we learn the more nitrogens you put in a ring, that's the one that's less aromatic. So instinctually, if you're faced with a problem like this that is bewildering upon first sight, just fall back on first principles and say, all right, probably we can just disconnect that ring. And if we disconnect that ring, it leads us back to, we're disconnecting the ring with more nitrogens in it, that leads us back to something, look how simple it has immediately become by applying this logic. Look what happened. Now we know if we treat this with trimethyl orthoformate or triethyl orthoformate, we should get out the product. Now we need a way of making that. And this just comes from recognizing that there is a hiding nitrile here. So little hiding nitrile rule comes to save the day. And where does this thing come from? And where does this thing come from? Now we're getting easy, right? You've already seen how to do this. So you can imagine. That can simply be formulated here to break that bond. Then you do your condensation, wherein there's a uh, addition elimination. Following that, all of these intermediates are telescoped to give you your cyclization across the ring to give you, you now your amino pyrazole, which then is treated with a acylating agent here to bridge these two together to give you this final product, which can be treated with POCl3 and then your amine. So had we shown you this in lecture one, probably it would have been hopeless. But um, no. yes. Could you potentially start with um, the 135 uh, triazine with uh, two chlorides and then uh, N aminate selectively? You can't N aminate a, a triazine, unfortunately. It's too dead electronically. You'll Could you chlorinate an N uh, triazine? Okay. Triazines are, think of it like trinitrobenzene. They, they have nothing left to offer on the nitrogen. Okay. Now you may be able to make, you know, if you talk to the people in the energetics world, uh, you probably with forcing conditions can make anoxides of these things and start making some really, but that's why they're in the energetics area. Okay. Uh, 
because uh, you, you make them, but then they go boom very quickly. Um, so triazines for the civilian um, space, uh, just consider them as something that you cannot uh, easily either alkylate, oxidize, aminate, chlorinate, never going to happen. Okay. But Thank it's a you. great question. It's great. All right. And I think that's our time. Luckily, we don't have a look at that. That's all we have to, to as our spillover for the next lecture. Um, so remember, at 10 o'clock and 30 minutes from now, we have an amazing uh, duo uh, of process chemists from Bristol Myers Squibb that is not open to the public because of IP reasons, but to the people taking the class scripts, uh, it's open. And then tomorrow, we have another lecture. Uh, we'll cover benzodiazepines, maybe even a little bit of patent space if time permits. And uh, then Friday is our last open to the world class, uh, all new on saturated heterocycles. So uh, congratulations, folks. You did really well on what is the most complicated lecture of this course. Tomorrow's and Friday's should be um, vacation mode for your head by comparison, okay? All right, thanks folks. We'll see you tomorrow or some of you later in today.